Isaiah chapter number 14 verse 18 talking about the fall of Lucifer written or not written but the events that happened long before Job long before the, the earth was created or when God visited and said let there be light let there be uh, the moon let there be all that stuff we read about a being in heaven that fell and we read about his outcome is he's going to end up in hell. And everybody's going to be in hell is going to be amazed at who this being is. And we read on. It started off verse 18. All the kings of the nations, even all of them, lie in glory, every one in his own house. Well, it's a big, expensive, honorable thing to be a ruler of a nation. There, there was a time in America where every little boy wanted to be president. I suppose everyone in, in England during the old times wanted to be a king and wanted to be a queen. Or something honorable. But sometimes, according to Matthew 4 and Luke 4, sometimes people are put into position by worshiping Satan. And some are put in position by God. When Babylon was destroyed overnight, I believe it was Cyrus or Dyrus, whichever one it is, both of them were set up by God for the Jews. But thou are cast out of thy grave like an abominable branch. Now you read the Bible, a capital B for branch is the Lord Jesus Christ. We're still talking about Lucifer. We're talking about Satan, the Antichrist. And even in the grave, cast out of thy grave, One day, the graves in hell and the sea is going to give up the dead. Revelation 20. What is that sea? That sea is what's above your head where there are powers and principalities. Where Satan and his dark forces are right now. That can't be the seas on, the, on earth because the earth is gone. Heaven and earth fled away. And as the raiment of those that are slain, dead people, from wars, from murders, people who have been killed by someone else, thrust through with a sword. So that would be a war, maybe someone being robbed. I mean, you just don't go up to somebody and take a sword and kill them. It's not an everyday thing. That go down to the stones of the pit as the carcass trodden under feet. Now you run that back to Genesis 3.15. But you see this in Revelation 19.19 19 and 14.20. You're looking at the, the Antichrist. What's going to happen to him? He's going to get a, 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 a bad right eye and a bad right arm. He's going to die and be resurrected and be an awe to all the world. You know, all the world will awe the Antichrist dying and coming back, but they won't awe that the Lord Jesus Christ got the victory first. Thou shalt not be joined with them in burial. He's not going to be buried. Jesus Christ was buried, sealed, bound with the grave clothes. Because thou hast destroyed thy land and slain thy people. Well, look at that. He kills his own people. The seed of evildoers shall never be removed. Renown, excuse me, renowned. 
famous. That's not true today. There are people that are lifted up in the textbooks of the public school system and the college who are wicked and vile and they're praised and probably got their pictures up on some wall and memorial of the person. They even got streets named for them. And their life, no matter what a title goes before their name, is wickedness and vileness. Of course, all in the name of freedom. There's coming a day that the renowned are not going to be praised. The day before the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. You think Jesus Christ is going to come back and praise evildoers? Prepare slaughter for his children. For the iniquity of their fathers. That they do not rise. You know in the tribulation that there is a rapture of the tribulation saints? Just like the church will have a, a rapture one day. And when we're raptured, no unsaved person is going to go up in that rapture. When we meet in the clouds, there will be a 100% assembly of saved people. You can't. You don't have that in the church today. I'm sorry, you don't. I don't care what church you're. You sit in a congregation on your typical Sunday morning when most of the people who are, who are part of that church will be there. Not everybody in that church is saved. There's gotta be somebody. At least one person in that church is there, not saved. At the church rapture, when we meet in the clouds, those that have died and those that are still alive and remain. 100% of the assembly in the clouds will be saved. In the tribulation, when the, when the rapture happens in the tribulation, 100% of those people by faith and works will be caught up. Those who have the mark and those who want to worship Satan and those will be, they're not going to go up. See, the rapture will tell you who, who, who's who. <coughs> nor possess the land Israel is going to get the land even though they don't have it today one day they're going to get that land and Lord Jesus Christ is going to be seated on David's throne in Jerusalem nor fill the face of the world with cities The wicked won't be overpopulated. There's coming a day when the wicked won't overpopulate the world. What do you think that's going to be like? When you will get people who will be set up Christians who serve the Lord, who suffered for the Lord, will reign and reign in righteousness of no bribery, of no cutting the, the corners, but always doing that which is right. That's coming a day. But we're in a period right now where the Antichrist, he's at his zenith. And once he reaches his zenith, he's going to have three and a half years of a fall. <coughs> A fall where the, where the sun won't give his light, the moon will go dark, the stars will fall, and men will cast their idols into caves and run from the Lord Jesus Christ. We already read yesterday, Satan is not in hell, but he knows he's going to hell. And Jesus told us that God made hell for Satan and his angels. Now, Satan knows there's a place for him. I wonder if Satan saw God created. How did God create hell? Did he do let there be a burning torment place? For, I don't know how he did it. That is the final outcome of the Antichrist. And what is his final deed on this earth 
in this world to destroy God's people, the Jews. And how is God going to curse the one that's cursing the Jews? He's going to put them into a lake of fire. Where the condemnation, the damnation of God will be upon him. For I, God, will rise up against them. Now you don't want God against you. Things don't work. There's a battle in the Bible where God sent hornets. There's a battle in the Bible where the enemy turned their swords against their own self. They were sitting there killing each other. Saith the Lord of hosts. And cut off from Babylon. Alright, we're looking at Babylon, the historic Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar. But we can jump into the future mystery Babylon of the Antichrist. What is the Antichrist and what is the tribulation going to be like? Read Exodus. Read the book of Daniel. There's going to be a golden image. You may have the Colosseum with the, with the lions, but we do know one thing. There will be beheadment. There may be a fiery furnace. If you don't fall down and worship at the sound of the music. And all, you know, the sheriffs and the, all the titles. In the tribulation period, you ain't going to be able to call the police and get help if you're a Jew. Or want to do right and, and obey the law. And, and follow what the Bible says. You won't be able to seek the law. They'll be against you. Bible on the name and remembrance and son and nephew, saith the Lord. Job eighteen nineteen. As far as the nephew. Family thing. I, God, will also make it a possession for the bittern and pools of water. And I will sweep it with the besom. Now, there's a good trivia word. What on earth is a besom? And I will sweep it with the besom. God gives you a definition in the Bible of a, of a word you don't know. It's a broom. Imagine God taking a broom and sweeping. Of destruction. Uh-oh. He's using a broom not to sweep up dust and all that. He's using a broom to hit bugs. Trying to kill them. You know, can you see in Egypt them doing that with the frogs and the locusts taking their brooms and you know, batting them around trying to sweep them out? It said that the frogs were even in the kneading troughs. They were in the oven. They were probably using brooms to try to get rid of all that. Guess what? It's coming back. Of destruction, saith the Lord of hosts. You wouldn't think a broom would be, but when the old World War II, when the U.S. submarines come back to port, would it have been the East Coast or the Pacific, if they sunk shipping, whether it be Germany or uh, uh, Japanese, they would take a broom and tie it to the mast. So when that when that submarine came into port, they would look up, and the first thing they would look was for that broom. That means we made a clean sweep. We went out there and did what we were supposed to. Then there would be cheers and you know the music playing. He said, "Where did that come from? Where did they get that idea? Come from God. Come from the Bible. And you probably don't even know that. If you were to pull every U.S." sailor of the submarine fleet of World War II and say, hey, what's that broom up there? He'll tell you the whole story and he'll probably tell you who, what they sunk or what enemy they sunk, how many tonnage, 
what the ships were, where it happened. They'll be happy to tell you the story. Then you turn around and say, well, <coughs> let me ask you a question, sir. Thank you for your service in our military. But can I ask you a question? Yeah, what's that? Where did that idea come from? Why a broom? Why not a rake? Why not a torpedo? Why a broom? Because other destruction in the enemy, and it's found in the Bible. See, you got to know your Bible. you got to study your Bible. Let's say one day you are talking to a World War II submarine vet. And you want to, how do I start a conversation with him about, did your ship ever have a broom tied to the mast? Yeah, we did. And then let him talk. And I say, can I show you something in the Bible? So what you're telling me is when you went out there in the service, you had an utter destruction of the enemy. And you tied that broom on the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I show you something in the Bible? You open up your Bible, Isaiah 14, and you read this passage. you got now him captivated. Wow, I never, never knew that. Yeah, that meant, wow. I mean, you got an open door. You deal with the florist. You walk in the store. You got a lily in the valley? You got the rose of Sharon? No. Can I show you where you can find it? You got a patch in the Bible. That you can open up the door. You, you deal with fishermen. You know where you can go with that one. The first four men Jesus called were all fishermen. You got a guy who's always putting his foot in his mouth. Well, go with Peter. My heart goes out to Jesus. You can show where John laid at the heart, the holy heart, and heard the heartbeat of God. You got somebody who's into 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 Chevy trucks, the heartbeat of America. Say, I can show you the heartbeat of God. There's things in the Bible that if you learn and study and know where they are, they are open doors for a witness. And there are things that people do in this world and they have no idea why they do it, and they have no idea that the source is the Bible. <coughs> the Lord of hosts has sworn <coughs> what is called saying. Surely as I, God, have thought, so shall it come to pass. And as I, God, have purpose, so shall it stand. You know, you, aren't you glad that some of your thoughts don't come to pass? Have you ever thought about something? Have you ever thought about if it ever actually really happened? I mean, we have bad, wicked thoughts. But God is holy. God is right. And there are things that he thinks of that do happen. And we're talking about the loving God. God is love. And we're talking about the thoughts of God for destruction. How's that? Yes, God is love. But God is a holy God and God hates sin. And some of his thoughts are, I'll take the broom, I'll just sweep your butt out. Now we talked about uh, a couple chapters ago. It was back in um, the Assyrian. So a couple chapters back, we talked about the Assyrian. Here we go. We we're just on Babylon. Now we're back on the Assyrian. I will break the Assyrian in my land. That's God speaking. It's in Palestine. It's in Jerusalem. It is in Israel. Because upon my mountain. Jerusalem is a series of mountains. And upon my mountains tread him underfoot. Run back to Genesis 3.15. Then shall his yoke depart from off them, the people. 
What did Jesus say, uh, you know, about the yoke? He says, come upon me. Take my yoke, it's easy. Those are heavy laden burden. The Pharisees were laying such a burden on those people of adding to the law. I mean, you had to wash your hands. You couldn't go so far. You couldn't do this. You had to do this. You had to exchange the Roman money for our money, blah, 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 blah. That's exactly what the Antichrist is going to do. The Antichrist is going to be likened to the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes, and the lawyers in Jesus' time. That said, Jesus said, woe unto you, Pharisees and scribes and hypocrites. Woe unto you, lawyers. Satan is going to turn the law. It's the, it's the time of the law. But he's going to turn it up a notch and make it even more. Listen, I don't care if you stockpile food in cans, as your religion tells you to do. If the Bible says you cannot eat without the mark, you're not going to eat. Now, I don't know how it's going to happen. But your stockpile, if you don't have that mark, you're not going to eat. Because the Bible says you've got to receive the mark in the time of the tribulation. Not a man buy or sell. And his burden depart from off their shoulders. Well, who's the one to come to relieve them? The Lord Jesus Christ. Zephaniah 3.8 This is the purpose that is purpose upon the whole earth. universe <coughs> even the earth that they didn't know about the Native Americans in all the world they had no idea and from the stuff, some of the stuff I've been listening to and all that with the Vikings and the Russians there was a known continent in the time of Christopher Columbus. They just thought the world was flat. But America was known. Well, Native America was known. It wasn't such a mystery. Now, in the Bible lands, I don't know. Maybe the Chinese came. Listen, the Chinese and all that were all around it. You had all these people come into Jerusalem in their, in their, in their caravans, their train. The, uh, the Queen of Sheba. You had the Ethiopian eunuch. You had uh, the Ishmaelites were coming through when they sold David. That was the media. That was uh, hey, listen here about you know we went to this land and they, you know they don't eat cows. But they're starving to death because cows are grandma. We're gonna be talking about India, and then the Indians would come over. I mean the true Indians from India, and they which had their spices. They would trade their spices all around, and tell their story. There's a bunch of people over there, and their eyes are slanted. It's weird. And then, you know, they'll tell about of all the places they visit and all the stories. But the whole earth, the whole world earth, and this is the hand that stretches out upon all the nations. Even the ones they didn't know about, the Aztecs. All the American Indian tribes. All the island nations. The United Nations set up. God is his purpose to, to, to gather all the nations together. For the Lord of hosts has purpose. You can't change God. You know, some idiot writes a purpose book. Well, what about God's purpose? And who has disannulled it? Who's going to change God? Moses did. You know, God repented at Moses' words. I don't ever read anywhere else in the Bible. Anybody said to God, and God said, oh, I repent. And maybe he wanted to. I know Moses. And I know Moses is going to show up in the tribulation period. Maybe he'd be making a little inter intercession for the people. I don't know. 
and his hand, God's hand, is stretched out. Who shall turn it back? Moses did. You know, they say if Moses and God ever got angry together, the Israel would have been gone. There's points where God says, those, people, those are your people. You let them out. And Moses like, uh, 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 uh. Now, Lord, if you do that, your people that you put out of that nation are going to say against you. And then they turn around and blame Moses for all the problems. Moses is the one that spared them, the Lord Jesus Christ type of. So what's the Bible say about Moses? A prophet liken unto you. Jesus was making <coughs> intercession for them all the time. You really think that God was pleased when they put his son on the cross? I know it had to happen. But you think that really pleased God? You do? What did Jesus say on the cross? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. What do you think God was going to do at that moment? For Jesus to say that. Go ask Moses. He was ready to wipe them out. Even though God knew that Christ had to die on that cross, Jesus had to, on that cross had to say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Moses had to say, God, calm down. They're your people. You vowed an oath to them. But there's coming a day when God's wrath is going to come out and nothing's going to stop it. When the Lord Jesus Christ comes back on that horse as a lion, you ain't going to give him a, bad, a baby rattle. You ain't going to give him a pacifier. You ain't going to give him a bottle. He's going to give you 14,000 degree burns. That's what he's going to give you. And he'll be holy and righteous to do it for rejecting him. And serving Satan. <clears throat> In the year that King Ahaz died, was this burden. Alright, so this one's dated. So you go back and find where Ahaz died. This is when this has happened. Rejoice not thou, whole Philistina. Pil don't rejoice <clears throat> because the rod of him that smote thee is broken now don't go rejoicing because the one that beats you up is dead now we're talking about the Antichrist for out of the serpent's root Genesis 3 15 Revelation 12 shall come forth a cockatrice, a even more vile, poisonous snake. And his fruit shall be a fiery, flying serpent. Now where did you see that? Oh gee, and what did Jesus say? That as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so shall the Son of Man be worshipped. Uh, wor uh, uh, great. When that Antichrist dies and is resurrected, he's going to be worse. And the firstborn of the poor shall feed, and the needy shall lie down in safety, and it will kill thy root with famine, and he shall slay thy raiment. Howl gate. That's where all the people met. That's where all the official business was done in cities. Cry, O city. Thou whole Palestina art dissolved. For there shall come from the north a smoke, and none shall be alone in his appointed time. What shall one then answer the messengers of the nation? That the Lord has founded Zion. And the poor of his people shall trust in it. There's two classes of people in the tribulation. 
Rich and poor. There's no middle class. They're gone. How do you get rich in the tribulation? Receive the mark. How are you poor? Don't receive the mark. Plain and simple. Gentiles are rich. A Jew, well, there will be some Jews, but a Jew primary cannot take that mark. Being a Jew. It violates the law. You know, one of the things we're getting closer to the time. You're seeing everyone being a tattooed nation in America today. Young women, men, young men, old women. All but the kids. You drop that law. I believe there's a law that a child can't be tattooed to a certain age. You let that law be dropped. And a parent can give their child permission to get a tattoo. And the Bible says, in the law, which the law is coming back, the temple is coming back, thou shalt print no marks or make no cuttings in the flesh for the dead. What do they do when they give you a tattoo? They're cutting your flesh. They're making marks. And what is the most heaved after wanted tattoo? It's either a snake or a skull, if not both. Well, that's death. Not too many tattoos around there that says mother or a heart. You look at some of the tattoos people are wearing and you reference, you you ask yourself, you look at that tattoo and say, is that of God or is that of Jesus? Then you turn around and say, well, if it's of God, show me where God said, go ahead and put prints on your, mark, on your body. And you won't find it. The poor people of the of the tribulation period are be those who want to do right. The hundred and forty four thousand will be poor. Those that run down the sale of Pichu will be poor. Those who are in the stores and buying things, those will be the rich. They got the mark. So we've been we're seeing the fall of Satan. And we're seeing the, the, the kingdom and the ministry of Satan in this chapter. <clears throat> he's got a kingdom. And he's got a ministry. The kingdom, and he's sitting on a seat in Jerusalem, in the temple, proclaiming himself to be God, religion. He's even calling down fire and doing, doing miracles for the Pentecostals to make, to make them happy, please, as cake. Maybe he's got weird sunglasses to make the morons happy. That is his kingdom, a seat. We read about that. This is not where he wanted the seat. He wanted the seat in heaven. God says, you fall down, I'll give you the seat in, in a high mountain called Jerusalem. I'll give you that. I'll let you deceive the nations. I'll let you do all that, but you, you're going to end up in hell. <clears throat> 